Well, uh, welcome uh, back. Uh, I uh, am going to talk today a little bit about climate change because it is such an important global problem. And that's really going to uh, introduce us to flow in porous media because there's the idea of storing carbon rather than putting it out into the atmosphere, storing it in a porous uh, medium. And uh, we're going to talk about the equations of flow in porous medium at the end of this talk and then all of uh, tomorrow. Here's a, both an example of what climate change might do to us and a porous medium. So if it rains, when it will eventually here, there's the question of how the water goes down uh, the porous uh, medium. Now, I'm going to show you some slides which I'm, uh, well, in some sense afraid are not totally up to date because I'd have to change them all the time and I can't be bothered but you can easily extrapolate them for yourself. This only goes to 2005. Uh, if I just uh, continue it to 2018, uh, it'll look exactly the same. And this just uh, indicates... Is it linear growth after that? Or it's linear growth? Well, it, it's pretty uh, linear, yeah. Uh, sorry? After, oh, you, you can extrapolate this. Uh, yeah, it's pretty linear. And it looks not any, any different. Um, and please do ask questions, you know, I uh, enjoyed that. Um, so, uh, these are the fossil uh, fuels, uh, coal, oil, gas. A small amount of our energy comes from nuclear and hydro uh, uh, schemes. Uh, but most of it comes from uh, fossil fuels. Now, this is the so-called Keeling curve, uh, because Dave Keeling came as a postdoc to uh, uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography to work with a man called Chip Cox and neither Keeling nor Cox had the slightest idea what they wanted to do. And Keeling said to Cox, look, I'm quite a good sailor. Could we do something that involves sailing? And Cox said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go to Hawaii? There's some wonderful sailing around Hawaii and measure the carbon dioxide. Hawaii is in the middle of nowhere. We don't know what the carbon dioxide is. So uh, Keeling said, oh, that'll be good fun. And he was the first person to measure the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. And you see it's been increasing and increasing on average. It's now over 400. It's uh, up here, something like 405. Um, seasonal variations as the trees take in carbon dioxide as they grow. And then when they die, they give it back to the atmosphere. But there's no doubt that it's uh, increasing all the time. Here's Dave Keeling. He's unfortunately died. So what happened? The observations were important. And his son took them over. And I like that. Uh, I've forgotten his name. Ralph Keeling. Uh, his son now uh, continues the uh, Keeling curve. And you see, here he is, uh, Keeling building named after him in the uh, graph uh, behind uh, there. This is now the Indian CO2 emissions which uh, are increasing, increasing, increasing this time along this, this axis and uh, hundreds of thousands of kilotons along this axis. Uh, the uh, details don't matter here. What does matter is that it's going up and up. And each country is uh, like uh, that. For this, I want to show you a video uh, which I've prepared here. This time it'll work, I hope. This is now the world and the change between 1890 and uh, now. And what you see is that the temperature increases in places and then it decreases. There's a definitely a temporal variation and a spatial variation as well. And that's why people say, gee, uh, is there really global warming? It's uh, colder this winter than it was last winter. There are definite uh, uh, changes. But with time, you see it gets hotter and hotter and especially in the uh, <coughs> Arctic uh, region uh, here, where it's going to melt the ice. Uh, so there's both spatial and uh, temporal uh, variation. Uh, so here's the global average temperature, and this is very much a global problem. Anything else, uh, you know, the uh, um <coughs> amount of pollution over Kampur or... Uh, the uh, f fogs in London, they're local problems and a local problem. This is a global problem. And here's the temperature, 
the average global uh, temperature increasing on average. There's no doubt that there are bits when it goes down and bits where for a few years even it seems to be getting better, but on average it's uh, going up. I'm sorry to give you an example from England to start with, uh, but warm spells have more than doubled in uh, duration. And again, you see the spatial variation, uh, even over a little place like uh, Britain. It's definitely getting warmer and warmer, and uh, Indians will understand this. This uh, summer in Britain was really quite warm, and people said, boy, it's really hot here, isn't it? And I said, yeah, that's what we call a summer. Uh, but in England, they're not quite used to that. But it is definitely getting uh, warmer. Here's uh, uh, India, um <coughs> where th there was a report and it said there's going to be an average temperature rise of two degrees. They're going to be extreme uh, regions. Again, it's... Uh, geographically uh, different from one place to another. There will be a sea level rise and there really can be quite some uh, problems. This is now uh, the, uh, in December 2020, uh, 2010, the difference uh, between uh, this and the 1961 to 1990 average. And again, you see there are variations. And I can't help but say that I showed this photograph at a or slide at a general uh, um, talk where there was somebody in the audience who was in the so-called civil service in uh, England, and he's the guy who makes decisions about England at least, and he put his hand up and he said, it seems to me getting much hotter, this slide shows, in the Arctic than in general. And I said, yes, that's a well-known fact. And he said, gee, I wouldn't have known that. I thought it was all absolutely equal. And I wanted to say you're a bloody idiot. You may make decisions, but you don't have any scientific ability. You probably got a first in history or something like that. Um, this is uh, now an indication of how the world has expanded. Uh, this is the number of cars in uh, millions. Uh, I've extrapolated the last little bit. This is for the world. This is for the United States. So what you see, there are 250 million cars in the United States. That's about the population of the US. So what that means is that, on average, everybody in the US has a car. Little kids have cars. Um, no, says John. <laughs> But what he's saying, and is quite correct, some people have two or three cars, and uh, that's really not uh, necessary. But especially for John, uh, whoops, it's here, why isn't it there? Sorry? Oh, uh, especially for John, there were only 8,000 cars in uh, 1900. 144 miles of paved road and not one paved road in California. This is now looking at the Arctic, which is uh, melting. Uh, this is the area of the smallest extent in the middle of, uh, or the end rather, of the summer period in the northern hemisphere. And you see it jiggles along, but it's going down, and the lowest is in 2012, which is 3.39, which is down here somewhere. So it's definitely going down. But again... Does that include Greenland? Sorry? It includes Greenland. I, I'm sorry? It includes Greenland? It include, no, no, no. It's just this, no, it's just this, uh, this area here. Uh, sorry? Does, oh, okay. Well, it includes then Greenland. Um... Now the point is, if you look at special bits of it, whoops, you can see either it's on average not moving, on short-term average, or even in some places on short-term average, the uh, ice is uh, increasing. But you've got to see the difference between the long-term average and the short-term uh, average. This is now again uh, the, uh, the Antarctic, uh, the, the 
thickness uh, change uh, over this period of about uh, 20 years. Um, and this is uh, a loss of uh, ice. This is a gain. There's been a few small gains around the eastern part of Antarctica, but in West Antarctica, there have really been large uh, uh, losses. Now, this is a very interesting graph for two reasons. It shows the temperature uh, relative to the presence as a function of time. We're here, this is 100,000 years ago, 200, blah, 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 uh, almost a million years ago. And this is the carbon dioxide concentration, which we get from looking at ice cores. And the first thing you see is that there's an enormously good correlation between the two. When uh, the concentration of CO2 goes up, uh, so does the temperature go up. When it goes down, and uh, so on. So that's the first thing, yes. Uh, I, uh, uh, again, you look at uh, cores and at uh, um, plant species and things that have uh, lived like that. There's probably an error bar slightly in here, but only a slight one. What were the reasons for the carbon dioxide variation? Ah, well, th that's a very good uh, point. There's no doubt that the Earth puts out carbon dioxide in volcanic eruptions and things like that. There's uh, a large um, component that's natural of carbon dioxide input and output, taking it into uh, the oceans, and that large amount actually is uh, larger than the contribution that man makes. But it's like a seesaw. It may well be that uh, this person on the seesaw is very heavy and this person is on the seesaw is very heavy, but some child who weighs relatively little gets on this side and that pushes it down. There's, there's no doubt there has been more carbon dioxide and hotter temperatures in the past before mankind due to uh, um, uh, natural events. Volcanic Sorry? Volcanic activity. Volcanic activity can actually put out of carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Well, Kim, yeah, I said uh, from volcanoes, they're definitely put in, uh, and there was much larger volcanic activity in the uh, past. In fact, if you have a look at any picture, painting of a saw, there's always a volcanic eruption going on in the background. Every time a dinosaur was around, there must have been a volcano. So that's the first thing, the correlation and the change. Correct. To one side or the other. It, it can make a difference. And to uh, forecast a slide that I'm going to show you, this is uh, 800,000 years ago, 700,000 years ago. Uh, even our parents and grandparents, as old as sometimes they seem, were not around uh, then. So did it matter that the sea covered all of Britain or all of Bangladesh? No, it didn't matter at all. Now, it does matter because now there's a huge population that lives on Earth and we're around. Oh, the other thing that's most important in this graph, and you see it best in these examples here, these larger examples, is that it goes up quite quickly and it goes down again relatively slowly. So ice melting can happen quite easily and the temperature can increase but it's more difficult in the sense of temporal variation uh, to freeze the ice again. So once we melt it, it's not going to freeze at all uh, quickly. Uh, this is now just showing how the carbon dioxide concentration has increased dramatically in the last, uh, this is the uh, time along here, that's 2000, that's 1750, uh, since about the Industrial Revolution, since we've started to put in carbon dioxide. And here there was not much uh, variation. There were the volcanic eruptions and things, but it didn't matter uh, too much uh, because man wasn't uh, there. This is now a prediction of the IPCC. Here's the graph that I showed you before. This is a low-level prediction. 
This is best, whatever best means, if uh, things go well, and this is a high-level prediction. Now, this is an interesting graph, but like the next one, uh, which shows the temperature in the uh, past and the calculations uh, from uh, the Met Office in uh, um, Britain. Uh, he, in 2003, some 3,000 people died because it was a <laughs> what uh, somebody in Europe would call a hot summer. <laughs> An Indian wouldn't <laughs> say it was hot at all, but uh, it did cause a lot of trouble. And the implication is in the 2040s, this will be the average temperature. In the 2060s, it'll be the minimum temperature if you extrapolate this. But now both of these slides are total and utter rubbish from one point of view because he knows what's going to happen. If the President of the US decides to have a war with China, it's not going to go like this at all. <laughs> It'll be quite different. If something else uh, happens, either man-made or possibly uh, naturally, uh, these predictions won't happen. And it is important to know that and to realize uh, that. It'll cause lots of uh, difficulties uh, because sea level is going to go up, as I'll show you in a minute. And there was an article in some British newspaper showing the 10 most affected uh, cities. Uh, and I thought I'd just take uh, a photograph of them. This is uh, uh, from the newspaper. This is the Phoenix, uh, showed that the US will be affected. Here's Bangladesh. And uh, in Bangladesh, it is a big uh, problem. Um, because there, as you may know, 150 million people living in Bangladesh. The problem is the sea will rise, but slowly, and not tomorrow. It's, there's not going to be a real problem tomorrow, but slowly the water will uh, rise, and so it will be realised that the 150 million people who live in Bangladesh are going to have to be moved. They're going to lose their country, everything. That's going to be terrible for them. But because it's slow, they're going to be taken in somewhere or other. And that's not going to make it either easy for them to learn to speak a new language or be in a new place, or for the people who uh, they come and join. I once gave this talk to Australia, uh, or in Australia rather, and uh, somebody in the back said, don't worry, they'll never be allowed in Australia, it'll be all right. <laughs> and I was both annoyed, <laughs> but didn't quite know what to say. <laughs> Um, and uh, another um, Darwin in Australia is uh, under a danger. This is now a, a, again uh, showing a prediction, which may or may not be correct, uh, saying how the temperature will rise and how it'll be spatially different from what it was just uh, 20 or 30 years ago uh, in uh, some 80 years. This is the observed sea level rise, which has been remarkably linear at three uh, millimetres uh, a year uh, due to the melting of uh, ice. Uh, and this is the contribution, mainly to thermal expansion. So as it gets warmer, the ocean expands, and there's some four kilometres on uh, average uh, of it. Glaciers and ice caps melt uh, a little bit. Uh, then there's some that's come from the Antarctic ice sheet, but of course that could increase, and the uh, Greenland uh, ice uh, sheet. I don't want uh, London to look like this. My son was a member of parliament, so he would have had to swim around here, and that doesn't seem to me uh, good uh, to uh, me. This is what happens, and that's what we have to be nervous about. Ice will flow out, um, and we'll talk about some of that, and crash into uh, the uh, water. What is it? Oh, Now, people sometimes say, save the earth, and they go on big demonstrations, as you see here in England. This, let me tell you, is totally false, totally useless, totally stupid, no point in it whatsoever. That's what we need to do. The earth is 4.5 billion years old, it's going to be around for another about 13 billion years. Do you want to make another bet on that? We can. <laughs> 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 
but I want to be around for 30, wouldn't you like Ishan to be around for 13 billion years? <laughs> we can pay. But, you know, it's the people on the earth. The earth, I guarantee, is totally safe. It doesn't give a damn whether uh, Bangladesh is underwater or uh, not. Um, and at the recent COP24 uh, in uh, Poland, uh, huh, just forgotten his name, uh, David Attenborough, uh, the famous British uh, ecologist and uh, man of means, and now some 94 or something, I think, gave apparently a very moving uh, talk. Okay, well, just a, a summary. Fossil fuels make 85% of the world's energy demands. We're putting out at the moment 37 billion tonnes, gigatons, of uh, carbon uh, dioxide. China puts out the most, then comes USA, and then comes uh, India. It contributes 6% of uh, that. And the UK and Australia is quite small. But now, you can consider the mean per person. Per person, it's five tons a year, and Australia comes first. <laughs> Beats India, look, by 26 runs. 31, I guess, was the total, but 26 here. Um, USA comes second, and Nepal <laughs> has almost nothing. But there is an important point here, and I don't know the Indian uh, uh, story, but I do know the Australian story, that Australia puts in you know, a half a percent, uh, now I think that's risen a little bit, uh, of uh, the total. So if that was cut out totally, it wouldn't make any difference. On the other hand, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that's put into the atmosphere from fossil fuels that originated in Australia, mainly coal, is four and a half percent. Four and a half percent is also sufficiently small, if you cut that out, it wouldn't make much difference. But the difference between four and a half and one is enormous, and especially in financial terms. Australia benefits enormously from uh, selling uh, coal and they're building new uh, container wharfs just to be able to ship the coal out. So financially, it's the right thing to say this is all rubbish. There's no, you know, climate denial. It's not going to be like this. It's a great story. But I don't think you want to consider that. Okay, well, now, this is a typical uh, power plant, um, a 500 uh, megawatt power plant puts into the atmosphere some 10,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide each day. And you can imagine how many such coal power plants there are. And Sleipner, which we'll talk about in a moment, stores in a way that we'll also talk about 3,000 tonnes uh, per day. We're probably storing something like, t totally throughout the Earth, uh, 10,000 tonnes uh, um, per day. And that's just uh, equivalent to what one power station puts up. Really very little uh, indeed. And the idea is that we'll store it in the Earth at some depth so that the carbon dioxide, which is a liquid, of course, uh, sorry, is a gas, uh, at uh, atmospheric temperature and pressure. As we go down and the pressure increases because of the weight of the overlying rocks, it gets compressed and then at about 800 uh, metres down, it comes to a critical depth where it becomes supercritical. So it behaves like a liquid or more like a supercritical liquid than a uh, gas and uh, that's better for storage because you've compressed it uh, and you don't have to have as much uh, space. If you go further down, uh, it doesn't compress much more and it costs much more to store it at larger depth and there's not much advantage. So most, but not all, of the storage ideas would be at uh, round about uh, a kilometre. In rock that has uh, space, uh, to do it. And Sleipner was one of the biggest and uh, best uh, examples, and there's a wonderful story here which also brings in the finances. In about the early 1990s, um, the Norwegian government went to Statoil, the uh, um, Norwegian oil company, and said, look, you happen to be taking uh, natural gas out 
uh, and burning off the carbon dioxide. That's not really very good. We'd like you to store it. And what you could do is store it in uh, here. But we know that's going to be expensive. How much do you think it will cost? And they said, mm, about $55 a tonne. Okay, said the Norwegian government, if it's $55 a tonne, we'll give you a $5 a tonne tax break because we understand it's uh, expensive and we'd like you to do it. So Statoil said, thank you very much. Uh, we'll do it and have uh, stored a million, dollar, a million tons a uh, year at the cost of $10 a tonne <laughs> since 1996. So they make a lot of money out of this. Uh, and what they do is they bring it down, as I uh, said, carbon dioxide is less dense than the interstitial water around here. It rises, supercritical carbon dioxide, you say, it rises through this porous medium. Looks just like this uh, sponge, not maybe this, well, maybe pretty close to this color. Um, goes up and there's a relatively very permeable, uh, sorry, very impermeable uh, cap rock, as it's called, and it spreads across as a gravity current. Uh, in this uh, medium, it's uh, less dense than the interstitial fluid in a way that we'll uh, talk about and we've already suggested uh, a little bit. Now, what they uh, imagined was that release it at the bottom of this uh, layer and it would go up a, as a plume. But what they then found out was that there are a number of relatively thin, relatively impermeable sort of layers, but that had holes in it, so to speak, that stored uh, part of uh, the uh, supercritical carbon dioxide for a while and then it leaked through. This is a two-dimensional picture. Of course, it isn't quite two-dimensional. Um, and there was one, two, three, four, four north and then on until you get to ninth of these uh, layers. And we have seismic, uh, oh, this is uh, another one, this, huh, just forgotten what this is called. Another example of carbon uh, uh, storage. And the fun, uh, I think, in working in this area is that there's some theory, which I'll tell you about. There's some laboratory experimentation, which I'll tell you about. And also you can interpret field data, uh, which uh, I think is uh, enjoyable. There are a number of competing phenomena. Somewhere around this slide has gone out of uh, order. You're trapping fluid by structural trapping, i.e. by having impermeable uh, layers, by capillary or residual trapping because surface tension plays a large role, as we'll talk about in detail, and I'll show you an experiment in a moment. We have dissolution trapping, and this is really fascinating, that the carbon dioxide, the liquid carbon dioxide, the supercritical carbon dioxide, can take about 3% of the interstitial water, that mainly salt water, but it can only dissolve about 3%. But that mixture that results is heavier than either of the initial conditions. It's heavier than the uh, um, supercritical carbon dioxide, and it's heavier than the uh, salt water. Now that can happen, we know about that in the oceans, it happens quite a lot, but the wonderful thing here is if the two get together, only a little bit at a time, and get heavier, then it'll fall down and then it's quite uh, safe. Sorry? Is it stable? Is the mixture stable? Is it safe? Well, it'll fall and... Uh, no, 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 it, it's, a, it's a mixture in the sense that it's a chemical mixture and it'll stay together, yeah. Um, then there's the question of leakage, and we'll have to talk about that because we don't want the stuff to leak out. Um, now, I think this is a fascinating uh, problem, but nobody's looked at it, which is if you put uh, carbon dioxide in, by conservation of volume, the interstitial fluid has to go further away. It's mainly salty water. If you push it aside into drinking water, that's not at all good. Nobody, to my knowledge, has looked at that, <laughs> except one person who at a conference about two or three years ago 
had this as the title of the talk, and I went salivating, really looking forward to it, and they talked about something totally different. <laughs> and when I asked them, they said they just wanted to attract the audience. Then there's the question of how much will it lift up uh, the uh, structure, uh, and it's not much, only uh, millimetres. Okay, well, now we all know about the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, but we're going to talk about flow in a porous media, and here's a bit of uh, the earth, and I've got some water in here, you have to believe me, I couldn't get a transparent thing, and you see this porous media will take some of uh, the water and it will move in these pores, you all know what a sponge is. Now some of you might think that I'm cheating slightly here, you can't see uh, the water, that I've not got anything here, so just to prove that I'm not cheating, I'll get rid of some of the water. So there is water and it must go through uh, this uh, porous uh, medium. And even more will come this way. So just the orientation plays a large role. And we're going to work out how that uh, flows. What is it that keeps it there? What makes it go here? So, we're going to look at flows in porous uh, medium in general. And of course, there are many more applications. I'm just talking about uh, carbon capture and storage because I've uh, worked on that. We've got the Navier-Stokes equa equations. <coughs> they have to hold in the very little pores, but we don't want to look in detail at the uh, flow because this is what, in some sense, in general, it looks like. The Navier-Stokes equations will play a role here, but it's all over. And this is the perfect place to tell the story that I, uh, when I was in Australia once, I, got, I was in the mathematics department and I got the mathematicians together with the engineers and with the medics and the chemists and six from each group would talk to each other. And we had the engineers once, the six from each uh, side, and there was an Indian engineer there who came to me later uh, when I talked about flow in porous medium and said, I didn't listen to a word you said. And I thought, Joy, that's uh, very uh, kind. Um, why are you telling me that? And he said, because you started the talk by saying that a lot of fluid mechanics considers flows down pipes and talks about Poisson distributions and what it might be if it's a free uh, surface. Uh, and then you talked about flow in porous media where you said it went like that through here. He said, I didn't listen to any of that. What I was thinking is that 95% of the theory on traffic flow looks at what happens when it goes like this. But in India, where I come from, <laughs> It goes like this, so I can understand your flow in porous medium. I was thinking of traffic, and we did then uh, do a little bit of work uh, together. Okay, here's now uh, an example, particularly for uh, carbon dioxide. We're putting in the carbon dioxide. Here's an indication of the structure. There's some salty water or some brine here. There's a uh, porous uh, rock here. We've got some dissolved carbon dioxide. It's really quite a difficult uh, um, problem. Here's uh, even a closer bit. You can see that you might have some air in here. There are pores here which might be full. This is the rock. Uh, and you could solve the Navier-Stokes equations all the way around, but that wouldn't uh, be very effective. So what we're going to do is use Darcy's equation, which is put forward by uh, Darcy, instead of the Navier-Stokes equations. The force is still the same. The effect of gravity is still the same. This goes out because this is all low Reynolds number flow, just as John has been talking about. So there's no left-hand side. This term is here. And instead of, instead of uh, taking del squared u, the Stokes uh, relationship, we're going to make it linearly proportional to uh, u, coefficient of dynamic uh, viscosity here, and some permeability uh, k uh, here. 
So that's going to be our almost linear equation instead of uh, uh, the Navier-Stokes uh, equation. It's not only viscous, but also the, the because of the uh, because of the channel walls. Is that what? Oh, that's a, a good uh, question. What happens to the channel? And you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just wondering whether tortuosity will play any role in communication. Oh, what a good question! Tortuosity does play a, a role here, and if I just could show the next uh, slide. Um, what is tortuosity? Sorry. What is, oh, tortuosity says, how difficult is it to go round here? What's the difference between balls, if I have a porous medium, and let's say this, and the earth in detail doesn't look anything like this. It has different size pores and different, and that's the tortuosity. So you're quite right. How does it make its uh, way uh, through? And that's going to be in K. And why it's a slightly embarrassing question is I'm not going to be able to handle it properly. Uh, I'll explain how we try to mimic the uh, tortuosity and get a uh, uh, reasonable expression for it, but we can't do it properly. Yeah. Ah, well, I could apply pressure in two different ways. You're quite right. Here's the sponge, and it's holding the water. And it's holding the water in here because the surface tension at the bottom here, can, uh, uh, with the pores, can overcome the pressure, rho gh, where h is so much. Right? Now, when I turn it up like this, it can't hold it anymore because the H is larger, now the H is bigger, and so surface tension is not able to uh, um, hold it against this pressure gradient. And then eventually, after getting rid of uh, enough uh, water, uh, because it drains a little bit from here, it can hold it. But now I cheat by going like this, and I again increase the pressure difference between here and here, and the surface tension can't uh, hold it. Now, I can tell you what surface tension is, but what I can't really tell you is what the tortuosity of this uh, sponge is. So I just make an approximation to it. Because if I have a different sponge, the tortuosity will be rather different and it'll be slightly different. But I'll explain how I measure it, even if I don't totally understand the tortuosity. Uh, it, it could well be pressure, and pressure variation will play a large role, and we'll talk about that. And you'll have to stay long enough to hear it all. <laughs> okay, here's a, a, another example of the importance of, uh, um, of flow in porous uh, medium. Uh, Sorry? Uh, sorry, yes. Resistance due to the channel. Yeah. The flow is occurring because it is flow, flow, and through the narrow channel. Yeah. What about the effect of the walls of the? Oh, uh, so if I understand you, what you're saying is, here we have a porous medium uh, with thin channels that you can flow through. Shouldn't I be able to do the same thing by a channel? with closely packed wall, uh, closely spaced uh, walls, and let the flow go down here. And that's absolutely uh, correct. So and you just said you, when you have shown that will be different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and when I have closely packed walls, closely spaced walls, and so I know exactly what the geometry is, don't have to worry about tortuosity, then I can work out K exactly a quarter of the square of the uh, distance between the walls. 
Okay, and remind me, well, I'll remember and come back uh, to that. Um, because I'm still talking in uh, general here. You, this is a sort of a, just a general cross-section. You have water that permeates uh, through uh, the soil here, and that's why it's mainly salty water, because 75% uh, <coughs> of uh, the earth is uh, covered, the earth's surface is covered with water, salty water, and it permeates through. But it also rains, and that rains relatively fresh water, and uh, that permeates through uh, the uh, porous medium. And the tortuosity can be really very different from one region to uh, the other region, and that's really an important problem that you have to take care of. To know what K, that's basically K the permeability of uh, the system is, and it's like knowing the viscosity. If you ask what happened, just one second, if you ask what happens with the flow, um, you have to know what the viscosity is. <laughs> and I'm uh, reminded, uh, Julian Hunt, who you may know, who's in fact born in India and raised partly in India, uh, quite a contentious character, uh, and uh, another man had a big argument, each one thinking that they had solved the problem correctly. And after the tempers died down a little bit, that took a few months, it was finally uh, realised one was doing the high Reynolds number flow and the other was doing the low Reynolds number flow. So <laughs> they got totally different uh, results. Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the pore space here plays an important role. There are some things that will be rather loosely packed and some that will be uh, rather strongly packed and that will make a difference in the value of K, the permeability, how easy it is to put th uh, stuff uh, through. A given pressure, how much flow will go from this imagined high pressure to this uh, low pressure, it will depend how much space there is between the uh, rocks, how closely the flow has to go like Indian traffic, or like uh, English traffic, and then they'll all come under K, the permeability, and I'll tell you in a minute how we uh, did this. And here's just some different examples of uh, geometry. Here's uh, Darcy, the French uh, guy, and there are two important uh, parameters. One is the porosity, the fluid volume to the total volume. So if the porosity is zero, then it can't take any uh, fluid in. If the porosity is one, well, it's, <laughs> it's only fluid. That can't happen in a real porous uh, medium. If you have randomly packed spheres, uh, it's about 0.37. Uh, if they're hexagonally and they're close packed, it's about 0.26. This has to be a variable between 0 and uh, 1, uh, and you measure it. Or so the spheres is the, the, spheres the material. The is the material, so that's the solid. And, and as you can imagine, in the Earth they do complicated stuff, but in the laboratory <laughs> we use uh, spheres and uh, simple stuff and uh, it's worthwhile knowing what the... Uh, in fact, I bet 99.9% .9 of laboratory experiments use randomly packed <laughs> spheres, uh, so we uh, all use uh, that. Then, as I've said before, there's no uh, momentum, uh, so the viscous uh, drag uh, dominates the u dot grad u, and the flow is proportional to the forces, and you get what I would just write as this, which I've written uh, before, uh, the pressure gradient, uh, the buoyancy, uh, the fluid flux depends uh, on, on what uh, reference frame you're in. But that equation I've already written uh, up uh, before. Oh, that's just moving the frame of reference. Uh, that's yeah. I, I t yeah, it could. This is now how we <laughs> measured uh, the uh, porosity uh, with a, uh, a summer student. We held the glass spheres here by a uh, grid that uh, had holes in it so uh, water could uh, flow out, and we put on top some fluid of viscosity uh, 
that we knew and density that we knew was, and it flowed through this uh, region. So if you look at the pressure, it's constant, it's atmospheric pressure here, and then it increases linearly in the usual way in the fluid, and then it has to be at zero pressure, oh sorry, at atmospheric pressure again here. So it has to decrease, uh, not obviously linearly, but it does decrease linearly, quite, quite uh, surprising, but important because it's this pressure gradient that forces the flow through the porous uh, medium. This is a very simple uh, situation, so you can solve the problem. It's just uh, one dimensional, though it's time dependent. Uh, you've got an initial pressure gradient due to this height. Eventually it'll be at uh, zero height, and, and you measure the time that it, uh, it takes. And if you non-dimensionalize it with respect to gravity, uh, and this permeability which we want to evaluate times the initial height, h naught, and the kinematic uh, viscosity of the uh, fluid, you can solve this problem, it's really quite uh, simple, um, to get the non-dimensional time at which it should all uh, uh, have fallen out as a function of the initial uh, porosity, uh, and if you know what that time is, you can go and you can get K from there. So that's how we uh, measured uh, the uh, K, um, but there's also a... Uh, but how did you get pi in the equation? Uh, uh, that uh, you, in a sense, look up. This is closely packed spheres. These are closely packed spheres and it's 0.38 or whatever it is. No, K is, uh, well, K would be a function of phi if they weren't closely packed, but they were something else. What I'm just uh, saying is the flow through here will depend on the porosity, and so you can solve those one-dimensional equations. Uh, we are solving From Darcy's equation, yeah. Darcy's equation has a K in there. Yeah, well, that, would you non-dimensionalize the K out, right? So you non-dimensionalize the time, and then you measure the time, for which this fluid flows through here. That tells you what that uh, time is in non-dimensional form. Um, and if you know that time in non-dimensional form because you know everything else, you can work out what K is. That's fine. I just don't see how you get the right side of the Oh, that, that's by solving the equations. I, I've left that out, if you like. No, no, no. Phi is, phi is input. Uh, you know what phi, uh, yeah, phi, phi is. is phi, phi, phi is the porosity. Because you, you solve a whole series of equations, which I'm not, it's a one dimensional. Uh I can understand. So, original equation, they don't have any phi in it. So, you're solving, uh, you know, dp dz, let's call it, min uh, well, no, plus we want dp dz, is uh, k uh, u uh, uh, over, whoops, k is here. Uh, I want mu, if I'm going to. Leave this up here, uh, plus rho g, uh, and uh, the, you're going to add a term here because, well, there's a time-dependent term because this uh, pressure gradient changes. As we go down, if it's only that high, it's going to look uh, like this, uh, and uh, so you solve that equation, and I, I, I'll show you where, the, where that is. And f phi, as I say, is the uh, um, volume fraction. How do you know that? How, how do you know that? Oh, how do you, you, you measure the volume uh, fraction by getting the balls and pouring some water in, and you see how much. The average velocity of the stuff through the porous medium, which is average of the whole cross section area versus the average of the porous space. Correct. That's, 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 that's okay. The if that's the. That, that's right. This, if you like, has a volume fraction of zero. It's just quite uh, fluid, and now it hits a region with volume fraction phi, and that's why and phi that's comes in. Um, now, there's something called the kazeni kamen uh, relationship, which uh, says that the permeability can be given by this volume fraction cubed over 1 minus phi all squared times d squared, the uh, 
size of the balls. And this works surprisingly well. In fact, the summer student was really annoyed that he did two weeks of experiments and measured everything, and then it was <laughs> pretty close to what uh, uh, Kazini Kalman uh, said. And he said, why didn't you just save me two weeks of time? And I could say, I hope this is not following, but it's true. He left science and uh, is now enormously wealthy <laughs> as a financier. I don't think it was due to that. I hope not. Um, anyhow. Didn't Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, but of course, it comes again to the tortuosity. Uh, there must be some difference between flow through here and flow in this uh, direction. I've uh, exaggerated it slightly by making uh, the ellipses uh, like that. But there's going to be the same uh, phi, but it's clearly going to be more difficult in one way. And here's uh, an example uh, uh, in Dorset. This used to be full of oil many, many years uh, ago. And the fascinating thing, to me at least, is that the porosity here is about 20%. It looks like solid rock, but it's actually uh, quite uh, porous. Okay, so now we're going to do some uh, fluid mechanics and uh, we're going to put uh, climate change and carbon sequestration a little bit in the background. And I'm just going to talk about flows in porous media and look at different uh, situations and how you'd solve them and uh, what it might uh, be like. Some of it is definitely motivated uh, by uh, carbon uh, storage, but uh, definitely not all of it. I'm going to uh, start by, uh, well, I guess I should first tell you that uh, about 10 years ago, and this is how I got into the subject, uh, there was a knock on my door and a uh, nice looking but rather small five foot or so uh, woman uh, came in quite nice looking but also rather tough and she said to me i'm sarah lyle i'm the captain of the cambridge university women's rugby football team and i'd like to do a project with you a final year undergraduate project with you on carbon dioxide sequestration and I said to her, look, I don't know anything about carbon dioxide sequestration. I can't help you. And there was silence for a few seconds. And then she just looked me straight in the eye and said, I'm the captain of the Cambridge <laughs> University <laughs> rugby football team. Yes, 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 Sarah, I'll do the project. I'll do the project with you. <laughs> so uh, we uh, did this project. We knew about Sleipner. And we said, what happens? if we have an input of smaller density than the interstitial fluid density in the porous medium, and it's all axisymmetric, and we want to calculate how the radius varies with time due to the constant flux in background million tons uh, a year of this relatively light uh, fluid. Now, using why is the inter because that's what happens in the porous uh, in, sorry in the carbon dioxide sequestration the supercritical carbon dioxide is less dense than the salty uh, water that's what you said the mixing causes it to oh, well, there's no mixing in this uh, model the mixing will come later this is a simplified model no mixing you said when uh, li uh, liquefied carbon dioxide yeah. mixes with brine yeah it becomes heavier is that what the reason is no well, that's going to come later there's no mixing in this model, it's just uh, spreading out without mixing. The fact that it's spreading on top rather than on the bottom because it's slightly heavier makes no difference. But I mean, why is it heavier? Sorry? Why is the, why is it well, th this is heavy because it's a salty water. Oh, it's salty water. This is salt because salt. The, the oceans yeah. spread salt. Uh, um, um, so we used uh, Darcy's equation to uh, get this nonlinear uh, partial differential equation for the spreading. It's really quite similar to what I've already shown, only this has an H here, whereas if it wasn't a porous medium, it would be an H cubed here, uh, basically showing the difference between proportional to U and proportional to del squared uh, U. You have this equation, and phi is very important because the area, or volume rather, taken up 
by uh, this is only taken up by the space. If phi was zero, for example, you couldn't shove it in. Uh, so that's a, an important thing. And I hope you know me well enough now to know that I looked at this equation and said it must be a similarity uh, solution. Similarity variable by balancing terms or any way you uh, like uh, tells you that a similarity variable has a pre-multiplicative constant, Q, which is the flux that's uh, being put in, gamma, which is a combination of the density, K, the permeability here, and G prime, G by the difference in density over the uh, density, over uh, phi, the uh, permeability, and mu, the viscosity of the fluid, and that has dimensions LT to the minus one, which is uh, important. Here's the definition of uh, G prime. So uh, gamma, Q, phi, RT to the minus one, but that tells you without doing any solution whatsoever that the radius must go like T to the half. So you can tell without solving this nonlinear differential equation, just balancing the terms, that the radius must go like uh, T to the half. So really the difference is because the viscous term is different. Because the viscous term is different. And your mass balance has a phi in it. Uh, sorry? And your mass balance has a phi in it. Uh, that's right, and the mass balance has a phi in it, and otherwise it it's comes from exactly the same condition. What is the pressure that's driving this flow? And if there's a different flux in here than in here, that has to be taken up by a change in uh, the height here. Well, T just renormalizes Q. Uh, sorry? T just renormalizes Q. Phi? Phi used to be sucked into Q, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, it always goes like uh, Q on Q, phi. Right, yeah. Correct, correct. Um, so uh, now you can also get a form, explicit form for uh, H, the height of the unknown uh, free surface. Um, and uh, what uh, you find is you want the value at the nose of this parameter just to normalize it. These constants, the Q is uh, normalized by phi, as John correctly said, uh, gamma here. It's going to be some function of Y which goes between 0 and 1, where a y is defined as the similarity variable in general to the similarity variable at the nodes. Now, you have to solve the resulting equation for f uh, analytically, but there's not a bad approximation, as I'll show you in a moment, to say it's just linear. That's definitely not uh, correct, uh, but it's a good approximation. And eta n is pretty much like 6 over pi to the quarter, near enough to 1. Sorry? F is some function. We're going to have to solve this. We're going to get a nonlinear differential equation for F, which we're going to solve analytically, but this isn't a bad approximation. So here are some uh, experiments, and you uh, so we uh, got not a whole axisymmetric uh, container, but uh, uh, I, I, I did the experiments in an angle. We released uh, um, blue-dyed uh, heavy uh, fluid, made heady, heavy with sugar, just like here, well, actually with salt. Uh, lots of uh, balls here, beads of, we could do different sizes. And you see that it's pretty accurate, and we'll see this a bit more uh, later, to uh, a straight... Uh, Oh, yeah, it, 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 it makes no difference because of the Boussinesque approximation, small, small de, uh, delta rho, whether you have it flowing on top or flowing on the bottom. It would make a difference if you did it light fluid here because this is a free surface, but that's not what happens. Uh, th that's another interesting problem. Now, here's the radius appropriately non-dimensionalized on uh, here that should go like... Uh, time to the half, and you see here, here's the theory. And here are different experiments, which this captain of the rugby team did, um, with open symbols when we release the <coughs> fluid uh, at the bottom here, and closed symbols when we release it at the uh, top. Now the idea that it's uh, a straight line just can't be correct uh, up here, but that means that close to the uh, origin, our straight line approximation doesn't work. But you see in either case, 
the radius uh, goes very well, as we'd uh, predicted. This is now the uh, shape of it, uh, here for one particular experiment, G prime and Q, uh, 30 seconds to uh, 10 times that amount. Uh, this is what it initially looks like, and this is what further will until finally it looks pretty much uh, like this. Now, if we plot the uh, experimental data against this simple form, linear with respect to y, you see it really does quite well for 80 percent of uh, the uh, radius. Uh, for close in, it can't do uh, very well. Uh, it doesn't do too badly when the fluid is put in uh, at uh, the bottom, but when it's put in at the top and falls down, it, you know, it's got to be uh, different. So it's only, and this is only an approximation, uh, and this, as we uh, said uh, in the seminar, the similarity solution can't be right at the initial condition, so you wouldn't expect it to be uh, good uh, there. Now, here's, uh, and we did this, and, and the reason why Sarah wanted uh, to do a project on this, she'd worked for the British Geological Society, which had some relationship with Statoil, who'd um, taken some data of what the radius, because they could measure that seismically, was as a function of time. Since we said radius goes like time to the half, it seemed sensible to plot the radius squared against time, and in horizon two, that means not the first one, but the second one, uh, they had these three uh, data points, that's all they had at that time, and we said, gee, we can put uh, best fit or straight line that according to our theory, and we can then extrapolate it and see when the whole process started. This is in time in years since the initiation. And we see in horizon two, it started almost immediately. So it went up to horizon one, it leaked almost immediately, came up to horizon two, and then it uh, spread uh, a lot. Uh, horizon three, almost the same uh, thing. Horizon four north, which is uh, out of the blackboard or screen, we only have two data points, pretty easy to put a straight line <laughs> through two data points. Uh, Sidney Brenner, the very arrogant uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, would say occasionally, you know, any old fool can put a uh, uh, straight line through two data points. What takes a bit of ability is to get the right straight line through one data point. But if you're as good as me, you get the right straight line without having any data whatsoever. <laughs> And he did get the Nobel Prize. Um, <coughs> anyhow, uh, Horizon 8, uh, we put it through, and you see it took a year before the fluid leaked through and got up to Horizon uh, 8. <coughs> so here what you are plotting is you, you put the uh, carbon dioxide at some strata, yeah. leaks up through the spaces, comes to the inter interface between the, whatever, the rock and the porous medium, well, th and then spreads. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, uh, we're saying from the data, we, w what they do know uh, is how it spreads uh, along that uh, <coughs> relatively impermeable, but there are holes in it, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, relatively impermeable uh, base. So, uh, and it spreads, if you like, and goes here on layer one, then it leaks a little bit and goes into layer two, layer three, layer four, layer four north, layer five, six, seven, eight. So it gets to Horizon 8 in a year, uh, a year after they uh, started uh, it all. The idea was it would get to Horizon 8 instantaneously. Sorry? Horizon 2 was the lowest one. The Horizon 1 was the lowest one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 was the uh, tallest. So it takes uh, longer. So <coughs> 2 and 3 go uh, immediately. How important is it? I guess in part it's important to see that they're really uh, pumping it in at a million tonnes a year uh, since they're getting a tax break. The sensible thing to do, and it does cost some money, would be not to pump it in at all and say, gee, <laughs> we're pumped in a million tonnes a year, can we have a tax uh, break? It's also 
what I won't talk about now, but there's slight deviations from this, in some sense taking, uh, uh, because the blob is not perfectly uh, symmetrical, because the tortuosity is uh, variable from one place to another, and we've taken an average uh, radius. But also the topography is not uh, flat, and if you look into the details, which I'm not going to talk about or haven't prepared to, you can learn something about the topography. Um, okay, well I of course got very excited by that and we uh, published that uh, in the uh, uh, paper and I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> uh, we used uh, their data uh, and they uh, then afterwards, I think submitted the paper, they said, oh we knew that all along. <laughs> no, I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> and they definitely didn't know the, the uh, theory. Then sometime later, we got some more uh, data. Let's look at Horizon 9 first. That's the top uh, one. And you see beautifully R squared against uh, time. Uh, horizon 6, Horizon 5, Horizon 2 doesn't fit. Why doesn't it fit? Well, probably what happens, it, it spread and then it came to a hole. And we'll talk about that in the permeable medium, and it all went up uh, the hole. Uh, so Horizon 2 was spreading like a nice, behave, well-behaved uh, gravity current in a porous medium, and then it leaked. So we'd better talk about leakage at some stage. Okay. Oh, I wanted to show you a, a video. Can I get hold of that? Let me try. Um, this is saying, look, um, it's not because of surface tension effects or capillary uh, effects. Um, what happens is you have both fluids mixing together, not mixing in the sense of uh, mixing and forming one system, but the, it takes a while for the water to get in. The water and the carbon dioxide have to share the pore space uh, together. And if you, that's due to the surface tension uh, effects. Um, and <coughs> there will be a high saturation of carbon dioxide here and a lower saturation here. And you can write down the equations uh, for this and it looks somewhat similar to what we got before, H uh, T times H times some complicated function which I don't want to write down of uh, the bond number, which is the ratio of the capillary forces to uh, the gravitational forces to the capillary forces. So if the bond number is uh, zero, that means very high capillary forces. If the bond number is large, uh, then gravitational forces play the major role and capillary forces uh, don't play uh, uh, a uh, role. So the saturation varies like uh, this. Very similar equation. Uh, here you uh, see it again, but uh, a similarity uh, uh, form uh, again. But now it'll depend uh, on F, the uh, details of eta n. And for reasons that I can't really explain, don't understand, um, no matter what the bond number is, the value of eta n doesn't vary very much. It goes pretty much at the same rate, uh, appropriately non-dimensionalized. I'm saying that 1.04 is near enough to 1.15. Um, whatever. That doesn't seem to play much uh, of a uh, role. I'd rather not talk about it uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, carbon dioxide. Just in general, if you have one fluid uh, coming in, and I think the n uh, or another, depending on the bond number, this uh, will be a different uh, shape. And and that's I think in the next slide. Um, well, the next slide uh, in a moment I'll get to what you're saying is to say, <laughs> coming back to this wonderful question always of the tortuosity, real porous media have a distribution of pore sizes and shapes and of course also tortuosity. And here are some examples of how the size, 
can vary because there's, of course, a spectrum. In some cases, it's mainly one size. In some cases, it's uh, two sizes. And now, what you see here is depending on the bond number, so here it comes to what you uh, want. This is a low bond number, meaning capillarity plays a large role. This is a uh, large uh, bond number, so capillarity doesn't play a role. And now, a narrow pore size distribution, almost the same uh, pore size, and this is a wide pore size distribution. Now what you, uh, so here's the definition of uh, the bond number, and what you see is as the bond number gets larger, there's less of a stratification, small bond number means capillary effects play a large role, and so the carbon dioxide or the fluid that's coming in doesn't want to get out of the way and the water doesn't want to get out of the way and so there's a fight if you like between them and there's more water here which has been taken in from uh, the outside and more carbon dioxide here which is where it's uh, been in. If surface tension plays a uh, relatively small role uh, then it all will uh, mix because there isn't this uh, fight. Um, They, they will mix, but th the question is how easily will just the water get uh, through, which depends very much on the bond number. How do these two interact? Yeah, and I'll show... Uh, sorry. Are you saying they mix at large bond numbers, or is it that the same water is... No, mi mix may be the wrong word. It's the question, I mean, I always, we used to, I don't know what happened in India when I was a little kid, well... You were all too young. But when I was a little kid, you were allowed to get mercury and uh, put it on a... Uh, John's li smiling, so it must have been true in America as well. Uh, you were allowed to get uh, mercury and uh, break the thermometer or something and put it on uh, the table, and it would spread, but then it would stay like a sessile drop. And that's because the bond number, surface tension effects, are really very important. Now, if I put mercury here there'd be a question how it would permeate through here depending on the surface tension between the air and the mercury or the carbon dioxide or whatever. And the bond number plays a, a role there. How easy it is to spread. And that, uh, I guess I'm getting confused with the fact that you could talk uh, about that without being in two phase. Yeah, no, I'm, there's a difference, uh, and maybe I uh, shouldn't have mentioned some sense at the beginning, there's a difference between mixing, where the two mix together to form a substance that takes the components of the two of them, where surface tension doesn't play a role and is heavier and will go down, and I'll tell you about that, and two fluids which are on a large scale mixed, but on a small scale due to surface tension, do not uh, mix. And it's the surface tension, just like the uh, mercury on the table, which uh, spreads. And I'll show you this a little better in the... Yeah, uh, sorry, I hadn't realised I'd get this far, though I'm pleased I... Let me... S I hope I can quickly... Fi this is uh, an experiment that I did at uh, the Royal Society some time ago. Oh, and I should put the sound on. Where's the sound gone? Uh, stops uh, the fluid running out. This is a, a oh, shit. No, oh, sorry. Yeah. What I'm doing, is I'm adding uh, fluid, blue dyed water. Uh, this is a porous uh, medium behind a lock gate. that it can hold this heavy fluid uh, against the air. Uh, just to prove to you that uh, in actual fact this is a heavy fluid and if I have more of it, it uh, so that the overpressure is greater and the surface tension, so it's exactly the same 
fluid as you saw. I now lift it up and uh, away it goes. And this will slowly drain out. And this now, if you put it upside down, is just like a gravity current. And uh, it doesn't make any difference whether gravity is going down or up. Uh, it will behave exactly in the uh, same uh, way. Anyhow, we could analyze that situation. We also found... Oh. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's it. So what you see is the effect of surface tension at first uh, with this uh, balls, uh, glass uh, balls, surface uh, tension could overcome a pressure of such a height and even though it was heavy fluid next to light uh, fluid it couldn't flow because surface tension kept it but if I made the pressure large enough then it could uh, flow because it overcame the surface tension. Now, I might tell you, I don't know whether you'll believe this or not, but I guarantee you it's true, that I thought of this experiment a day before I was to give a very big uh, talk, uh, name talk at the Royal Society. And I thought, oh, that'd be a wonderful experiment to do. I, look, I'm going to do it. I'll take the stuff down and I'll do it. And as I was driving down, I thought, Herbert, you're an idiot. You've never tried this out before. Are you sure it'll work? Uh, nah, it'll be okay. I mean, straight physics, without a doubt, it'll work. So in this uh, packed hall with some 800 uh, people and uh, a big uh, talk, you saw exactly what happened. Worked perfectly. And I remember driving home thinking, why were you nervous? It's clearly terrific. I've done it 10 times since. It's never worked <laughs> again. <laughs> it either leaks or something. <laughs> it was wrong. <laughs> so I was damn lucky. How I would have uh, handled it had it not worked there, I don't know. <laughs> I have some... Uh, oh, well, well really, uh, shut up. I've had here. enough of you. <laughs> uh, there's a gate here. <laughs> and that's the end of you. Um, so what... You say? When you were doing gravity currents yesterday... Yeah. You had ignored Yeah. I, I can't do everything. There's only a certain range which I can speak. <laughs> Correct. I, that would have been another thing to add in. Yeah. Uh, now, how long should I talk for? It's 22 now almost. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, talk about uh, this uh, situation. Um, and now we really are talking about flows in porous media is not uh, applicable to... Uh, um, carbon storage. Let's imagine we have a flow here, a fluid into the air, but it flows over a porous medium. It's going to seep through because there's a uh, pressure of the fluid of uh, density uh, rho here. Uh, it's going to seep into this uh, porous uh, medium and at the same time it's going to uh, spread. We'll have some inflow and we could either have uh, a constant volume release or a constant flux or let the flux go like time increase with time. Or we could have any general flow as we'll see in a minute. We're going to use Darcy's law which we've uh, written up uh, here um, and the velocity at this porous interface is going to be expressed uh, by this relationship basically just saying the pressure due to the overlying fluid is going to force a velocity at uh, the uh, top here and so that's going to increase the uh, volume here and that's the uh, relationship. The vertical velocity uh, for x uh, is uh, dependent um, on uh, h, the overall uh, height, and it tells you how rapidly L uh, increases. So you then get uh, this uh, differential equation, which is very similar. This is an axisymmetric case. Very similar to what I wrote before, except it has this right-hand side, which represents the drainage through the porous medium. And now we uh, have the uh, um, 
uh, constant volume, and that I think should be an L now that I see it, it's 5 times L dx, is qt to the alpha. So if alpha is equal to 0, then there's a fixed volume. Uh, if uh, alpha is equal to 1, it's a fixed flux, alpha 2, 3, 4. Now, you get this, and then you say, getting boring, similarity solution, get down the similarity, blah, 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 and what do you find? Can't do it. No similarity solution. You can write down similarity variables, no uh, difficulty, except when alpha is equal to 3. Now, why alpha equals 3 is a special case, I haven't the slightest idea, except then the terms uh, balance. So, alpha? Sorry? What's the type? What's alpha? Well, that, that's the point. You could make alpha 0 if it was a constant volume spreading, alpha 1 if it was a constant flux, alpha 2 if the flux increased linearly with time, alpha 3 is the flux increases quadratically with time. Why that special element the sludge idea? Uh, I think that's... Um, I don't think it's physically special. I think it's just mathematically special. It's an example of what I talked about a little bit before. You can have equations that look as though they'll have similarity solutions, but you just can't get them. Uh, the, you, can get a, you can get all these terms to balance, but you just, you just, can't, it just won't solve it. What, what can I say? Uh, you can write down, as you all know, nonlinear equations that just don't have. Uh, this is the evolution of H. Sorry? H is this. Plurality. What about? H is the plurality. Uh, uh, when I've written H. This. H should just be this, this height fluid. in here. Yeah. So there's another equation for L of T as well, right? And L is this bit here. Say? It must have its own evolution equation as well, right? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. It does have its own uh, evolution uh, equation, quite uh, correctly, but that's given mainly by this velocity that comes down here, and then uh, that tells you what the flux is, which is distributed along here. But the, uh, or the assumption, implication is that they both have the same nose length. We could have posed this as, ah, but they're linked. Yeah, right. So oh. Them yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's a different, that would get you to more, li yeah, you could pose it as two currents that are uh, linked. I'm wondering whether the alpha equal to 3 could come out from there, from, the, from there being matching. I don't think so, but since I don't know why alpha equals 3 is so special, <laughs> I, I can't answer that uh, very well. Um, but uh, here is, uh, 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 um, with, uh, well, this might be uh, part of it. If alpha is less than 3, then they stop after a finite distance. So, in other words, it propagates, but it then loses so much fluid if alpha is less than 3 that it stops propagating. That's the end of it. When alpha is greater than 3, so you're putting in with a flux uh, that goes quicker than t cubed, it will keep on going. And the similarity solution is just at the middle where it's balanced. I don't think that explains it, but it describes it. Um, and here, so you need numerical solution of the equations. And uh, here's uh, the numerical solutions suitably uh, non-dimensionalized for the maximum uh, distance uh, that has gone out, uh, the changes with time, max is a bad word there, it should have been the nose, uh, as it goes out with time. And here are a whole series of experiments. Here's the uh, uh, theory. And if it was not draining, in other words, it was just over a rigid surface, then it would look like that and uh, continue up. Um, so you uh, see here uh, what the difference uh, is. Okay, well, now a few questions, uh, which uh, I've talked about already. How long does it take to be attracted to the similarity uh, solution? What if the operator forgets to uh, uh, turn the source on over the weekend or say? Uh, how long does it take till it uh, gets there? I've talked about that. What are the effects of capillarity? Well, I've shown you an experiment, uh, but there's quite a little bit more on capillarity to uh, we could talk about. Uh, 
you know, I'm going to leave it at that, I think, because I've forgotten to load the next uh, movie as well. Um, this is, well, I'll explain this, but I'll start uh, again with this. This is uh, an experiment in the lab, taking into account that the carbon dioxide can dissolve a little bit of water to end up with a mixture that's heavier and hence falls down. Well, I never do experiments at uh, one kilometre depth or anything like that. So what I did was use the fluid I've used uh, before, uh, which I've called MEG, which is methanol plus ethylene glycol. And you can put different amounts of methylene, methanol rather, and ethylene glycol uh, together. This is 54% methanol, 51%, 48% uh, methanol. Uh, and now, here's the density of pure water, 0.998 or something like that. Uh, and here's the density of pure MEG, 54% uh, uh, MEG, 51%, 49%. And you see all the densities here of pure MEG are less than the density of water. But the mixtures, as you see along here, this is 50-50, this is 25% uh, of, uh, this is, sorry, 75% of water and 25% of MEG are more dense. So you get the water to mix in with the uh, MEG because of uh, turbulent uh, mixing um, and you'll end up with a mixture that is uh, more dense and if it's more dense, surprise, surprise, it uh, goes uh, down. So we'll do some experiments, that's the idea and that's uh, where I'll leave it because I have... Well, uh, what well uh, for example, say we put a layer of pure MEG on top of a layer of water. Oh. Oh, so you're asking basically a chemistry question. Why is it? Thermodynamics. Yeah. Sorry? Thermodynamics. Well, we can have an argument whether it's thermodynamics or uh, um, chemistry. Uh, I guess it's... No, no, no. I don't know. I'm a mathematician. I don't know the answer to that. I presume when they mix, there's the... Well, you know, I'm just uh, thinking, this often happens in oceanography and it's important when passes with different temperature and different salinity sure, get sure. together and they get heavier and go down. And no one's, in my knowledge, ever asked, gee, why is it like that? Um, <laughs> it may be that there are some chemical oceanographers who do, but I can't. Sorry? So I'm just this is probably a tie, not to do with the clock, but then have a hard time. So if I take myself with one particular mixture there um, and mix with water, and that mixture then does the, that, that's a homogeneous mixture of the meg yeah. and water. It's a totally homogeneous so mixture. It's a separation of the meg itself and a separate methanol that's separate by the with the water. Yeah, it's not that. It, it's okay. And I'm tempted to answer with the memory <laughs> that John may well understand. Um, when I came as a graduate student to uh, the uh, University of California, uh, the fees were enormous, but we got paid if we got straight A's. And we got an amount that was equal to uh, the, uh, a little more than the uh, fees. So, of course, that was important for me. And in my second year, I did uh, a mathematics exam that was set by my supervisor. And I went through it, of course, knowing I had to get an A. And then there were, I think, three questions. And one question I couldn't understand at all. Not at all. I, d I couldn't even draw the diagram. I didn't know what it was about. So I thought, this is $3,000 worth. <laughs> well, and that was worth a lot of money in those days. Look, the only thing I can solve, said the mathematician, is in those days, 
Y double minus lambda squared Y equals zero. I don't know anything else. So this somehow must lead to uh, that. So I wrote down resolving forces you get, Y double, and I worked out lambda from dimensional analysis. <laughs> I had to have one over time squared. I did think, as I recall, a little bit, is there a two or a three here? Well, <laughs> bad luck. So I just left it as a one. Two weeks later, uh, John comes in with the scripts all uh, marked, gives them out. I've got full marks for that question. And he then says to the class, I was really disappointed with question three. None of you could do it, I'm afraid, except for Herbert, who did it perfectly. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I've never told him. I now, it's the same thing here. How the hell? I'm a mathematician. <laughs> I tell you that this works. <laughs> I can only solve y double minus lambda squared y equals zero. But it was worth a lot of money to me. Okay, well, I'll, uh, let's uh, stop here and we'll uh, start with this and I'll uh, show you a uh, movie of uh, how that uh, mixes. <laughs>